Welcome back to Programming Connect for Windows V2 Jumpstart. Uh, this is Module 2. We're going to be talking about Connect data sources and programming model. I'm Rob Relier. I'm a program manager on the Connect team. And with me is Jesse Kaplan, also a program manager, program manager on the Connect team. Um, I've been a program manager on the Connect team, uh, working on uh, interactions and a number of other things. Uh, and formerly, I've been a, pro uh, a uh, program manager and architect in WPF and uh, XAML teams as well. Jesse's bringing a lot of great expertise here today. Uh, yes, I always bring the expertise. Thank you, <laughs> Rob. Uh, I'm a uh, program manager on the Connect team as well. I've been about two and a half years now. Prior to that, I worked for about eight years on .NET and the Common Language Runtime. And uh, big news, most of you have heard already, uh, Connect for Windows version 2 is available now. So what's new in Connect for Windows v2 uh, that's interesting for you? Well. The sensors are shipping now, today. Many of you have already received them, uh, and they're available for general purchase. The V2 SDK is in public preview now. You can download it uh, and start writing your apps immediately. There's a single set of cross-platform Connect APIs across desktop, store, and Xbox. Uh, and with these APIs, you can create and publish Connect apps to the Windows Store. Uh, we still have robust support for WPF, Windows desktop applications, and we'll go into a bit more detail of what that means in just a few minutes. In addition to that, uh, for the first time, we are having support for Unity for Connect. Again, the same APIs, both for desktop and store uh, applications. Today, we're going to talk about three major pieces. We're going to talk about uh, Connect development, an overview uh, of the sensor, of what it's like to write desktop apps and Windows Store apps. Then we're going into a bit more detail on the Connect data sources, the different types of data you can get off the sensor, the formats, how you can use them, that type of thing. And then to finish up, we're going to talk about some other tools that the Connect SDK gives you that uh, make it easy for you to uh, use this data in new and innovative ways. And we'll have a few demos throughout the day to show that off as well. So first up is the overview. Uh, on the Connect Data Sources front, we have a variety of feeds. First up is the color image. Uh, you can see a few of our developers as well as our team mascot in view right there. Uh, this is the IR version of the exact same uh, image. The depth map, as you can see, if you've seen previous versions of Connect, that depth map is a whole lot cleaner than anything we've had before. Uh, we're excited about that extra fidelity. Next one is an interesting data feed. This is the body index mask. This is a bit higher level. This image will tell you which pixels have players uh, or users being tracked uh, and uh, which ones do not. Next up is skeleton. Uh, more details later, but it's a 25 joint skeleton per person, along with interesting hand states and a few other neat details. And finally, I don't have a great visualization for audio, uh, but we also have the audio with a multi-mic array, sound source localization, all that cool stuff. So let's do a very brief demo and show you what all these data feeds look like uh, live. Excuse me. There we go. This is a little app that I used to uh, capture those images. You can see it's a Windows Store app. You just hit five and off it goes. And you can see easily the different audio feeds or the different video feeds of different types, skeletal tracking, hand tracking, uh, and all that neat stuff. And we're going to show you how to use this data in your application directly a little later on. So let's stop that and resume from where we were. So uh, before we go into the details, let's talk a little bit about the architecture, hardware spec, design principles, that type of thing. First off, at the bottom of the stack, you have the physical connect sensor. On top of that, you have the drivers. You don't really have to worry about these pieces. Uh, we take care of that behind the scenes for you. Next up is the connect runtime. This is where we manage the data from the driver. We run the various tech engines, produce infrared, depth, skeleton, that type of thing, uh, and make it available to all apps on the system. And on top of that, you have our APIs and the apps that use them. So we've got the native APIs for native apps. 
uh, .NET APIs for .NET apps, and then we have a Windows Runtime API for Windows Store apps uh, of all languages. And now you said all of these APIs are pretty much the same design? Yeah, uh, we actually designed the APIs once, uh, and then we ported them to each of these languages to make sense. So the only differences between the .NET APIs and the native APIs are the differences that you get when you take an API from .NET and you move to COM. So the collection types are a little bit different. You use the COM eventing pattern instead of the .NET eventing pattern, that type of thing. But otherwise, they're identical. Uh, and it's not on this slide, but the Unity APIs are exactly the same thing as well. They really are just the same APIs most appropriate for the language of choice and environment of choice. Uh, and one other thing to note, you notice that apps is pluralized in all of these. Uh, we support multiple apps running and using Connect Data at the same time for all of these APIs. So that's a big new feature from what we had before and was heavily requested. So we're happy to have that. Next up is the recommended hardware. Uh, on the CPU side, we recommend an i7 uh, to give both the Connect and your application a lot of power to uh, use it. On the RAM, we recommend four gigabytes. For GPU, it's DirectX 11 and it's required. Uh, we need some of those features to run uh, our engines. Uh, USB 3, Intel or Renesis chips, those are required. Uh, and the OS is Windows 8.0 or 8.1. Again, also required mostly for the USB 3.0 support. So we've taken advantage of DirectX 11 for some of our skeletal tracking code um, and other code. As yeah, well. it turns out with this new sensor that very little is actually computed on the device. And so what gets sent to the sensor is 10 infrared subframes. And so on the GPU and in CPU in that runtime, as we talked about, we take that data, we calculate the IR frame, the depth frame, and all the higher level stuff. And a lot of that happens on the GPU to minimize the load on the system. And so we need DirectX 11 for that, yes. Gotcha. A few design principles uh, to talk about when we put together our runtime and put together our APIs. We really want to minimize per frame allocation so we make it possible for you to run this continuously in a tight game loop without taxing the memory system. Uh, as we said, low latency and high throughput are also high principles for Connect that's usually very important if you want a responsive user interface or to track the world in real time, you need both of these things. And finally, we want to make sure that we expose data both as low level and high level. So we give you the basis infrared frame all the way up to skeletal tracking, uh, hand tracking type of things we saw earlier. So. Uh, creating a new store app using Connect is very simple. You go to New Project, you enable and you create a Windows Store app of your choice. Uh, you enable microphone and web webcam capabilities. Obviously, you don't want any app in the world being able to just look through your Connect, so it needs those capabilities. You add a reference to Windows Preview.Connect. It's in the Windows Extensions category in your reference dialog. And then you use the namespace, and off you go. So uh, let's actually see what some of that code looks like and see some of the types and patterns that give you access to all of this Connect data. First up is the Connect Sensor class. It represents a single physical sensor, and it's always valid. It's very easy to get. Uh, in your language of choice, you call ConnectSensor.getDefault. It will give you the default on the system. We currently only support uh, one sensor plugged in each machine at any time, so that is always exactly the sensor you want. Uh, you open the sensor, and away you go. If you call close, the data streams will turn off and will stop using the CPU and GPU resources in that runtime I talked about earlier. You can open it again when you need to use the data again. So you can open that same sensor, you don't need to get a new one. Exactly. Uh, and the sensor object works throughout. You don't have to open a sensor to use it. You don't have to worry about what state it's in when you start setting up your application. We'll show a bit of that in the demo later, but it's really nice. You just write your application, set up your events, your pollers, whatever, and then you turn the sensor on and off as is necessary, and you don't lose any of that state. So if you show user interface in your application that stops taking advantage of Connect, you should Turn it off. Uh, turning off the sensor okay. is fairly heavyweight. Uh, we'll get into a little okay. bit later about the right way to do it for really transitory things. But if you reach a point in your application where you're done with the Connect, uh, you can just close it. Okay. 
for temporary pauses, there's an easier and faster way. So, uh, the sources. Uh, you get these off of the Kinect sensor. It exposes metadata about each source, uh, and it gives you access to the readers, which we'll talk about in a second. The sensors expose one source per data type, uh, and as you can see, we have a variety of them here. Audio, body frame, body frame index, color, depth, infrared, uh, and long exposure infrared. So these, these concepts are going to be very familiar to V1 users. They called them stream, we called them streams in V1. They're now sources, but lots of similar names and sources. Yeah, as part of our move to being more a Windows API, hence the Windows preview, uh, we're following the Windows uh, design guidelines. And so the design guidelines say that, you know what, the things we had before were not streams in the Windows sense of the word streams. Uh, and so uh, we renamed them to data sources. It, better described the way you use these data anyways. So once you have a reader, the reader gives you access to the frames via eventing or polling. For most uh, UI framework apps like XAML or JavaScript, uh, you'll want to use events because that's the way these apps tend to be written. We also have polling for people who are working on apps more in a game loop style thing, say in their DirectX app. Uh, you can use these interchangeably, whatever makes the most sense for your application. Multiple readers can be created on a single source. This is another really nice new feature compared to what we have for Connect for Windows. Uh, Rob and I have written the code that has one piece of central coordination sending data to every single piece of an app that wants to access it and master a control program, managing lifetime and all that stuff. Uh, you don't have to worry about that now. Every component that wants to access the sensor data in your app can open its own reader, and it can access this data independently from each other. It makes componentization a whole lot easier. So it's another nicety uh, in the new system. And the readers here can be paused. And this is what I talked about earlier, Rob, about this is what you can do to short, shut down the data for short periods of time. So if you have a phase in your application where you know what, you're not interested in a certain type of new input or connect data, you can simply pause that reader, unpause it when you're done and you want the data again, and the events won't fire and the polling won't hit. So you don't have to worry about uh, getting data when it's not necessary, and you don't have to worry about resetting up your state afterwards because you've got the events, you've got your game loop running. Uh, it makes it a lot easier to write your application. A lot less error checking. So take a look at the code uh, for using the readers. Uh, it's pretty easy. You get the source uh, from the Connect sensor, uh, and you open a reader. And to subscribe to a uh, frame ready event, you simply subscribe to the frame arrived, uh, and you'll get called back when those come in. Next on the list is frame references. Frame references are what actually get sent in the frame event args, and these are the things that give you access to the frame itself. You'll see on the frame reference, we have the members acquire frame and relative time as the two keys. Acquire frame give you access to the actual frame. Now, why don't we give you the frame directly here? It turns out uh, that eventing in a lot of systems is uh, non-deterministic. It happens uh, based on what thread you are on, whether your UI uh, thread is pumping messages or not, how long it takes you to uh, re react to an event. And so it's possible that by the time your frame event fires and your code asks for a frame, that that frame has already expired. And so the frame reference lets you find out about these frames, know when they were, record, uh, when they were recorded based on the relative time, and then acquire them if it's still available. Uh, it would be nice maybe to be able to access old frames just as it is, uh, but again, one of our design principles was to minimize the per frame allocations. And so if we let you have an unlimited set of frames active, your application would quickly get bogged down in memory. So this frame reference pattern allows you to have access to the frames when you need them, and it also allows you to easily avoid uh, lots of allocation, and allows your application to easily catch up to the live data, because you're not gonna do any work if you don't actually get the frame. Yeah, we're dealing with so much data that, and doing 30 frames a second, so it's really important to be uh, concise in your code and what you do with it, how many copies are you making, um, and, and be efficient in that loop. Yep, uh, we do what we can in the API itself, and we try and make it easy and natural for developers to do the right thing when they're building their applications. So, uh, and then the relative time allows you to temporarily correlate between different frames uh, 
every source uses the same base point for relative time, so you can tell how long uh, was the time difference between a color or an infrared frame was acquired, for example. So the relative time start at zero when the app starts, or something like the computer starts? It starts at some time we don't document. Okay. Uh, it's not used to find an absolute time. It really is to let you compare times between the individual sources. Gotcha. Uh, the code for this is fairly easy. You've got your event subscription. Uh, you've got uh, it fires, and you get the frame reference from the frame event args. Uh, in C Sharp, it's easy. You put it in a using block. That using block will automatically dispose of the frame when you're done with it to make sure that you're ready to get your next frame. In JavaScript, uh, rather than the using pattern, there's the closable pattern. And so when you're done with your frame, you simply call close. In C++, uh, the smart pointers will decrement the ref count automatically. And as long as you uh, exit scope, then it will also be made available. So what happens if I don't use the dispose pattern and don't release or dispose the frame? Yeah, as we said before, we try and avoid the allocations. And so only one frame of any type is available at any point in time. And so, if you don't dispose a frame of a particular type, you won't actually be getting any more of that type. So very commonly in application, as you're building it, you find out, oh, uh, why am I not getting frames? It's usually because you've leaked a reference to the frame somewhere. So back to the meat of the issue, the frames. The frames give you access to the actual data uh, so you can start using them. Uh, we recommend you make a local copy or access the underlying uh, buffer directly. This gives you the ability to act on it very quickly without having to keep the frame alive for a long period of time. Uh, it contains metadata about the frame along with the data. So for every frame, it will tell you, say, the width and the height and the color format for the color frames. Uh, so it tells you how to use the data in addition to giving it to you. And as you mentioned earlier, uh, not closing or disposing your frames will prevent you from getting new ones. So it's important you do that. Well, I just told you all the basic components uh, of the uh, data pattern for Connect. Uh, I told you how easy it was. Uh, and if I tell somebody in a talk how easy something is, I want to make sure that I can show it as well. So let's do a brief demo starting from scratch, building a Windows Store application uh, that uh, gets and receives the displays, the infrared frames. He said it was four short steps to get going. And then a little bit of code. I don't know if I use the word number four, <laughs> but a few short steps. How about we say that? Sounds good. You can count, you can count as we go. Let's keep track at home. OK, so uh, we start up a new uh, window of Visual Studio. We'll create a new project. Windows Store application GSARP. And let's use just a blank XAML app uh, to get us going. So the first thing we need to do is we need to choose a processor architecture. Uh, one thing we didn't talk about is the Kinect doesn't support ARM devices. And so any CPU is inappropriate. In this case, for simplicity, we'll go to x86. Now that we've done that, we simply add a reference into the Windows tab extensions to windowspreview.connect. And as we talked about earlier, you need capabilities. So let's make sure this app has access to the microphone and the webcam. Both of these capabilities are always required if they use the Connect, regardless of which type of data you use. Yeah, even if they're not showing a color photo or something that you can identify people with, you need those capabilities. Yeah, it's just a much simpler programming model. So that's why you have both. Now uh, we've set up our application to get the data. Let's update our XAML page to have a place to display it. We'll do something very simple. Put an image in there. Give it a name. And since we're going to be displaying the, the infrared frames, we'll put in the resolution for that. It's 512 by 424. So moving on to the code. We'll need to use a few new namespaces. Uh, since we're going to be displaying images, let's take in some of the Windows uh, imaging stack. And now the fun part, we get to use Connect itself. 
Right now, in the store APIs, the, AP, the uh, namespace is Windows Preview .connect. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the other APIs? Uh, in the other APIs, the namespace is Microsoft .connect. Uh, the uh, Windows Preview namespace is indicating that we are previewing the WinRT APIs uh, for further inclusion in some form in Windows down the road. Okay, so let's start up. Don't like not implemented. Before we start writing the code, let's talk a little bit about the things we're going to need uh, to store in our application uh, for use elsewhere. First off, we get the connect sensor. Then we are going to be using infrared reader, so let's get one of those. We're going to need some data to copy the, uh, we're going to need a, a storage location to copy the data out of the reader. Uh, and IR data is in the form of U short. Now we're no longer packing in the player mask in the middle of that two byte yeah. data, which is nice. It's, uh, yeah, it's a, for those of you who've used the old SDK, uh, we snuck in the player data into in the, the in same the, the bit somewhere yeah, in the middle yeah. of the depth. Yeah. Uh, you don't have to worry about that. Those are separate streams now, so it's a whole lot easier to use. Uh, we're going to want to convert the infrared data to an image, so let's create a uh, buffer for that. And we are going to want to write that to that image we described uh, in XAML just a little bit ago. Uh, so let's store one of those. So in our loaded frame, let's get our sensor. The reader, as we said, you can get that off the infrared source on the sensor. Now we have to come to our buffers. We need to figure out how big they are. Well, let's take a look at the frame description for the infrared source. Uh, and get that data. Now, because you both need this information when you're setting up your application and when you're handling individual frames, you can get frame descriptions from both the sources themselves or the direct frames uh, when you get them. Frame direct. Frame description length in pixels gives us how many pixels is in the IR data. And for converted, because we're going to do it, convert into a, uh, into a RGBA image, uh, we need to make it four times as long. And next, we need to set up our bitmap. Sending it to width and height. Set up our image. Now that we've initialized all of our data and set it up to be capable of displaying, uh, let's get going. So we call sensor.open and subscribe to the event off of the reader. So uh, as we showed before, the first thing you need to do is you need to see if you can acquire the frame. Uh, from the frame reference in the event args,
And if the frame has expired before your event fires or before you're able to handle it, uh, you will get back a, a null frame uh, from the acquire frame method. And so we need to check for that. And if it's not null, uh, you can start using it. So let's copy that data into the array we allocated earlier and start converting that into an image. So for simplicity's sake in rendering, we're just going to take the most significant bits of the uh, IR uh, pixel and turn that into the uh, RGB values to give you an intensity. So this will keep the code simple, but it won't show you as much detail if you were uh, 10 feet away or something like that. Yeah, and, and that's why the uh, image is going to look a little dark, because okay. we threw away a little data just to make the demo easier to write. Uh, our samples online will show you great ways to visualize it uh, with a little more fidelity. There we go. Now let's convert that for You're missing your eye. I am missing my eye. We're going to need to do a little bit more here, aren't we? That's what you get for asking me questions in the middle of typing. four times for BGRA and for the alpha channel we're just going to choose one. So now I've converted the IR data into an image. Uh, You've got one more eye on line 60 I think. I do. Thank you. Uh, now that we've uh, converted the data into a BGR image, uh, let's put it inside of our bitmap. So it's a nice convenient helper on byte arrays uh, for .NET. And let's copy that directly into the pixel buffer of that writable bitmap and invalidate so that it updates. Now, Simply build, hit F5, and there you go. See, pretty simple. Most of the code I actually wrote was about converting uh, the data into an image and dealing with the UI framework. If you go back to the application code, you can see that getting the connect data itself uh, was very, very simple. Nice code. Now we've talked a bit about how to get the data. We're going to talk to you more about what the data sources are like, what the data formats are, uh, and how you can use the data itself. First thing to note, there are two sensors uh, on the Connect itself. There's the color sensor. It's 1920 by 1080, uh, and at 30 or 15 FPS, depending on how light the room is. The IR sensor is 512 by 424 pixels, and that always runs at 30 FPS. And there are a variety of data sources that are generated from the IR image, like depth uh, and skeleton, and so those will run at the same uh, resolution and frame rate as the IR sensor. Uh, one thing uh, also very nice is that in the previous Connect, it was a relatively low fidelity image, depending on what you wanted your frame rate. We do 1080p at 30 FPS now, uh, assuming your room is bright enough to give a good image on that. So oftentimes people would use the skeleton data to figure out where people were and zoom in on those things, but the old sensor didn't really have much resolution to, to go. Mm -hmm. And now you're able to zoom in and still see a good image. Yeah, now you get really good color data 
and uh, really good uh, ST uh, in depth and everything else to go with it. So starting with the color frame, uh, color sensor derived sources, basically it's just the color source. Uh, as we talked about 1080p, 30 or 15 FPS. The image is mirrored. Uh, that's to better match the other data sources and also to make it easier for machine learning. So it's optimized for programs to read the data, uh, less so for uh, webcams. But you can always flip it if you need to. The infrared frame source, uh, we give a 16-bit uh, intensity value. Uh, I showed you how to use that just a few minutes ago. Uh, and the ambient light is actually actively removed. And so we give you a nice, really clean IR image, uh, mostly just uh, a good view of the room. Uh, we use this for our identity technology on the Xbox because it gives you a lighting independent uh, view of a person's face to better do identity for. And I don't know how many of you uh, had looked at the IR feed for the previous Kinect sensor. Uh, but there was a star pattern all over it for structured light. We use a different form of depth sensing technology now, and so you can get this really clear IR image in addition to the depth and ST data. So speaking of the depth data, uh, we give you data in a range of 0.5 to 8 meters. Again, it's a 16-bit value. It's millimeters from the sensor's focal plane. Uh, and as you can see there, you get really nice uh, resolution. It's not just a higher resolution than the previous sensor, but a lot more fidelity in the image. You can clearly see the dog's outlines and paws and everything else in there. Uh, one other interesting thing to note is that in the previous uh, Kinect sensor, uh, we had an inf a uh, short range mode uh, where you can get shorter, closer up data rather than the further data. We no longer have that anymore because we can give you all the way to half a meter uh, to eight meters away in just one uh, data source. So you no longer have to make that choice anymore. Uh, body index frame source, it gives you again an IR image size resolution. Value zero to five will tell you uh, which pixel, uh, which person in the uh, body frame is in a particular pixel, and a value greater than five indicates that there's no tracked body at that point. So that's one of the big changes, though, is that's its own its own data source as opposed to being jammed in the middle of the depth. Yep. Uh, and, and for those of you who haven't uh, coded against our V1 SDK, uh, the fact that Rob has brought this up three times tells you how much of an improvement this is over the, the previous version. So yeah, it's a whole lot easier to use now. Uh, you don't have to worry about separating the feeds. It's just there for you. Moving on to the body frame source. Now we're moving into more of the much higher level types of data that we give you uh, based on the simple IR sensor in the Kinect. The range is 0.5 to 4.5 meters. This is lower than our depth range because we found that past four and a half meters, uh, the depth data doesn't give enough fidelity to give good skeleton tracking, so we clamp the inputs there. The frame data gives you a collection of body objects uh, with 25 joints each. We now give you six bodies instead of the two uh, that we were able to track in Connect for Windows V1. And each joint has both a position in 3D space relative to the camera lens and an orientation. So you get position and angles as well. Six simultaneous bodies, 30 frames per second. In addition to the basic skeleton data, we have a few other high-level pieces of data sitting on the sensor, uh, the body frame as well. We'll give you a hand state for two bodies, so opened, closed, or lasso. You can find that out about your app. I'm going to need to cut over to me because lasso is a non-self-descriptive, uh, non but uh, this is what the lasso signal is, open, closed. We also give you access to the lean data. The lean data tells you what the orientation of your torso is relative to your body. It's a nice higher level data feed that makes it really easy to use that type of data inside your application. Uh, so it's just more usefulness, higher level, less code that you have to worry about, and more functionality you just get by default. Uh, and you can see here from the viewer from one of our samples, these are the same two guys uh, with the green circle on one person's hand representing the open state. Uh, no circles, on the other hand, indicate that we don't see whether the hand is open or closed, and that's because he's holding a dog. <laughs> uh, 
onto the audio frame source. Uh, the data, data in the audio frames is audio samples captured over a specific interval of time, uh, 16 milliseconds to be exact. Uh, the audio data is associated with an audio beam. We actually have four microphones inside of the sensor, and so we can use that to figure out where in the room a sound is coming from and to focus on just that one sound rather than all the ambient noise in the room. We'll do this by default to point it at the person we think is most likely speaking. The application can also decide to point it in a particular direction if the application knows which user is engaged. For example, it can point the audio beam at the skeleton. So uh, we talked about all the individual data types and all the individual features we have on those frames. Let's talk about a few higher level concepts, some other important APIs that really help you take those individual pieces of data and bring them together and use them in multiple ways in your application. Now, as we said, we have two different sensors. Uh, we actually have three coordinate systems that we've talked about. Uh, the first one is color space. This is just pixels inside of the color image, 1920 by 1080, two dimensions. The depth space point, this is used for all the depth derived uh, image frames. These are just pixels, again, in the depth image, uh, starting from the top left corner at zero. And finally is camera space point. Uh, this, comes, this is what you get off of the body's joint positions. And so this will tell you in the real world meters from uh, the camera. So you can know where people are standing relative to the uh, connect sensor. Right, and itself. an important point you've said before is the, uh, the distance is not from the camera itself, but it's from the plane of the camera, is correct? Right. For uh, both depth and for skeletal space? Yes, it is. So if you point your connect sensor at a wall, you will find out that every pixel in that wall is exactly the same uh, data or distance away from the sensor. It's not longer the further out you get from the sensor. Again, data in that format makes it a lot easier to write your applications, detect planes, uh, so it just makes it easier to process. So that's why we give it that way. So with the three coordinate systems, uh, you need some way to correlate data from one coordinate system into the other, and that's what the coordinate mapper lets you do. It lets you take a, a position in uh, somebody's uh, skeleton and figure out, okay, where is that in the color image or in the IR image? Or it lets you take the body index mask we talked about earlier and say, okay, which color images have people inside of them? And so you can do some very simple green screening pretty quickly that way. Uh, we're going to show you the coordinate mapper uh, in a demo in just a few seconds. And as uh, you can both operate on individual points, so you can say, okay, give me this pic depth pixel in this color space. You can also convert entire frames at a time if you want to, say, colorize your depth map or something like but that. But don't use the pixel API if you want the whole frame. It's going to be a lot faster if you let us do the heavy lifting there. Yes. Uh, if you use the... Uh, per pixel method for every pixel in a frame, uh, there's a whole lot of API overhead. Do the whole frame if you need it. Next up is the multi-source frame reader. I showed you before how you can use individual readers to get access to individual frame types, but a lot of times what people need to do, say for coordinate mapping, is to get multiple frames that were captured at about the same time. And the multi-source frame reader allows you to tell us which set of frames you want, and we'll fire these uh, frame arrived events, or allow you to pull for them, uh, when all of the frames of the types that you asked for have come together and are matched. Uh, one important point to note is that we deliver these frames at the lowest frame rate of the streams. And so in a bright room, if you do color in infrared, you'll get it at 30 FPS. In a darker room where we're running the color uh, source at 15 FPS to get better images, the multi-source frame will only fire at 15 FPS. Uh, and we don't give you access to audio uh, through the multi-source frame reader because audio runs at 62 FPS and nobody wants half of all the audio samples in a room. Uh, <laughs> it, it doesn't make for a good sound, uh, so, so you have to get that separately. But the relative time will still allow you to correlate that to the images you get off of the uh, multi-source frame reader. So now that uh, I've shown you a bit more of the tools and more of the data types, let's expand our application to make good use of the body frame, coordinate mapping, and uh, multi-source frame reader and use all those features together. So going right back to the same application, 
First, we're going to update our XAML page to be able to display things. And for expedience purposes, we're not gonna draw the entire skeleton. We're just going to draw the head location of tracked players. So let's create a canvas to put that in. Uh, we're gonna set its width and height to be the same as the infrared image to make things easy. This will allow us to use the coordinate mapping feature to map between the color or the infrared image uh, and the joint location and easily put that inside the canvas. Going back to our code, we previously de declared what we needed for infrared. So let's add in the extra stuff we need to, to deal with body data. First up is a body array and next is the multi-source frame reader. We're not gonna use the body reader because we only want bodies along with uh, the infrared images in this case. So let's initialize a few things here. And we always give you six bodies, uh, so you need to make sure the array uh, is of that size. You can also find that constant on the body count property of the body frame source, if you're interested. Uh, I did have fun naming it. It's also the right name according to design guidelines, so it all works out. And for the reader, uh, the multi-source frame reader, rather than having it just be a property on the connect sensor, uh, you, let's go to the one that we stored, you have to open them because you need to tell it which types you're in interested in. So frame source types body, frame source types infrared. Subscribe to the multi source frame arrived event. And we're not interested in the IR frame arrived event. So let's just delete that. So uh, now we are inside of the, let's see, so you can see that we're inside of the frame arrived event for the multi-source. So let's start using it. Just as before, use this using block to get your multi-source frame. And you acquire it just like you do all other things. One thing that you'll notice as you start going through our APIs is we use the same pattern for all of our types of data access so that if you learn how to use one piece of Connect data, one piece of the Connect APIs, it's really easy to pick up the others. You can just follow the same pattern. So again, we check for null, just like we did for infrared. And if it's not null, we start going after the other data. So this is disposable again, so we're gonna use a using block here as well. Exactly. And acquire those frames. And here the pattern you're using is do it nest your using blocks? Uh, yeah, it's a lot easier to see on screen if you do it this way. You can get very long lines of code, especially if you're doing five different frame types. So now we need to make sure that both of those frames are valid. Make sure they're not null. And once we have that, we are good to go. So rather than write this again, I'm going to copy and paste the code from our infrared frame arrived event and use it as is here. And so next thing we wanna do is we want to draw a circle for the head joint in each of those locations. So to do that, we are going to need to add shapes. So you're gonna use an ellipse from Windows UI XAML shapes? Shapes, uh, and because shapes need colors, we're also going to use windows.ui where we get the color thing. 
So now that we have drawn our IR image, it is time to, uh, to draw some circles on top of that. So first thing we do is we get the body data. And we put that into the bodies array that we did earlier and go over each of those and look for head joints. This is one of the most common loops in connect programming here? Yep. For each body and the bodies. We give you a body uh, for every position in that array, regardless uh, of whether or not it is tracked. So you need to make sure that it's tracked. Uh, then let's get the head joint. Simple dictionary. Get the head. Uh, and let's figure out where that is in space, but first we need to make sure that it is tracked. Okay, uh, so if it's tracked, let's then use the coordinate mapper to create a depth space point so that we can draw that into our image. So we go to the sensor, it's coordinate mapper, and we want to map a uh, camera space point, which is what the joint is in, into depth space. Head joint dot position. So we've got the point, let's draw it. We're going to want to put it inside the canvas and we don't want to just display the last version's uh, head joints. So let's clear that out. and then create an ellipse to draw for the new one. Uh, let's D and fill, solid color brush. Uh, let's make this red. Add that to the canvas. And tell the canvas where to put it. Cool. So we got data from two feeds. We got it from the, uh, the body fra frame reader and from the IR frame reader. We're mapping the IR space into the, uh, or the I'm sorry, the body joint into the IR space. And we're going to render this and so we can go ahead and, and show interesting information uh, annotating the IR image. And because we made our circle uh, 50 pixels wide, let's make sure it's centered on the head. Oh, comma. Oh, yeah, oh, there we go. You got it. So this is an attached property, canvas set left and set top. So we set the uh, element comma value. Okay, and now we've got our IR image and a circle displaying right over my head. If you wanted to display the whole skeleton, you would just go over all the individual joints as well. So, uh, moving back. So we've talked about all of the Connect data sources, the patterns for accessing them, and showing you how to tie them all together. Uh, in the later talks in this series, uh, today, uh, we're going to talk about a lot of the higher level features that are built on top of what we just discussed. So we've got interactions, how you use UI frameworks, speech, face APIs, uh, and Connect Fusion, which gives you 3D object scanning. Uh, so let's move on to questions. You can see the resources uh, on the slides. So let's give you a few minutes for questions. Yeah, so I see there's one question here. Uh, we're recommending an i7. Um, from your slide earlier, can you use a Surface Pro 2? And um, yeah, I, so I, I have been using a Surface Pro 1 up to recently, and 
I'm able to run that just fine. Um, so although we're recommending an i7, an i5 for many of the uses works, works great. Um, and I'm using uh, Surface Pro 3 now and uh, very nicely. It's yeah. an i5. We ran our build demos off of the Surface Pro 1. So it works just great. Great. Uh, next question is, can I change the resolution of the data feeds? Uh, no, uh, for this sensor, we uh, have a specific set of settings. Part of the reason why is because we allow you to share uh, this data between multiple apps, and settings are interesting and uh, hard to reconcile between different apps if they can affect each other. The sensor is also a whole lot more powerful, so it will be able to give you both the resolution and the brightness you need. Uh, and the frame rate. So there's less need for the destructive settings than there was in Connect V1. Gotcha. There's another question here about the resolution of the frames being different from V1, 320 by 240, which was the depth image, one of the depth sizes you could get in V1 mm -hmm. uh, or V2, and they're listing the color feed here, though. So why, why are color and depth different resolutions well, or sizes? Colors 1080p because that's the resolution most people want for high definition color. Uh, and the IR and depth-based resolutions are based on uh, what worked best for our depth sensor. And as you see, you don't really have to worry about the two differences. Uh, the coordinate mapper makes it really easy to move from one of those resolution spaces to another. Gotcha. So there's a few questions here about skeletal tracking as well. Do you know the minimal distance that will uh, show up? Uh, it's actually about half of a meter, depending on what you can see. Uh, as we said earlier, the range. Oh, oh no, no. Actually, the, how, how much do you need to move before you pick it up? What's the difference between here and there? Uh, when you're standing, you don't need to move at all. It just detects you. Uh, when you are seated down, uh, it does look for movement. It depends on your environment. Gotcha. Some of these questions about skeletal tracking probably also could be handled uh, as part of Casey Meekoff's session, uh, module number seven. Um, Next question, uh, is there an accelerator in the sensor? Uh, we're not going to tell you. Uh, <laughs> uh, there is, but it's not exposed directly into the APIs. What we do give you is we give you the orientation to, relative to gravity, uh, so you can see, find out the orientation of the sensor. In the future, we might give you that data based on the image that we can see in the room. So we're giving you the data that you need rather than giving you the details about how we actually capture it. Cool. I think that's uh, all the questions we have time for right now. Uh, thanks, thanks, Jesse, for a great session. Uh, we learned about the Connect data sources and the programming model, a uh, great foundation for the rest of the day. And uh, we'll see you back in 10 minutes. Thank you for coming. Thank <music> you.